Welcome ST Rappaport to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? Amazing. Thank you so much, Michael, for having me here. Of course. I love your energy. As soon as we got on the call, I was like, oh, this is going to be a good one. And so I have you here. You're a productivity coach. You are the founder, CEO, probably of Life Picks University. It's all things social, Life Picks University. You have a podcast, Life Picks University. So I'm sure we're going to be learning a lot about how the brain works with you and then how to improve our life. So in your own words, can you tell the world who you are and how you help? Yes. So like I said, I'm a productivity coach, but I don't just teach you like so cool tips and tricks and like how to be more productive by like planning your day and things like that. Rather, I get to the core of the issue of why are you having a hard time being productive? What is getting in your way of stopping you from doing what you want to do? And that depends on how your brain is currently thinking, the way its brain is currently wired and is processing information. So if you could change the way your brain thinks and the way your brain sends messages to different neurons, you're going to have a really easy time being able to be more efficient and effective. Mm. And getting that brain into that type of thinking pattern, is it an easy task or is it going to be something that's going to require a large amount of work? Yeah, so it's not so much about easy or hard. It's more about being intention and conscious about it for a while. Like it doesn't happen overnight. Like how long is it going to take? Not two days. I'm not here to give you any magic tricks, right? Like your brain has been thinking for 20, 30, 40 years in this way. And now you all of a sudden have to say, actually brain, I want you to think in a different way. So it doesn't take, thank goodness, another 20 or 40 years, but it takes a good few months of you being very conscious about this is what I'm doing. Mm. So the brain is going down a path per se right now. So it's going down a path. And then all of a sudden we have a life change or something that we say, you know, what? I want to change my life. I want to change my circumstance. So we decide to change it. Why do we decide to go off that path that we were already on? Maybe our parents put us there, society put us there, peer groups put us there. What is the reason why we are on a path that we eventually decide to get off on? Yeah. So usually, like you said, a lot of the way that we're thinking is either because of like the way we grew up from our parents or just the way we saw other people doing it. Some of it is actually genetic, the way your mm. brain processes information um, naturally from like how you were born. And then depends which way you want to go about this. We could either talk about what happens like a life circumstance changes, right? Like you get into an accident, something happens, you're like, now I'm taking control over my life. Now, what happens then is you now have some sort of real motivation, something deep inside you. You have your why of why you want to go and change your life because then you're going to go and work really hard. Another way to look at it is simply, I want to change my life. I want my thinking to be easier. I want to be more efficient and effective. So I could teach my brain new thinking skills. We call them cognitive functions. We all use them, but some of them are weaker. Some of them are stronger. We could strengthen our cognitive functions, strengthen those thinking skills. And now what we want to do are same everyday tasks that we were doing before now just happen so much easier. That's mm. a word more easy. Any word you want, we, we can make it a word today. <laughs> so what I want to do is break that down. What you said into two aspects, one dealing with the trauma, and then one, having the opportunity to say, well, we have this whole life ahead of us that we can be anything we want. So the first thing I want to do is to talk about trauma. Many people come to me after they had a trauma, some hardship in their life. And that will be the majority of my clients. They have went through something, a challenge per se. And now we are in the healing process. When we get into that mindset of we had this hardship, it acts like a motivator for us, where it's like, okay, we know we don't like this feeling, we want to change. But sometimes people decide to stay in that area. They stay in that realm of this trauma, this negativity, they become a victim, and they don't choose to change. How can we encourage people that if they're not in a good place right now, or if they maybe have the idea that they can be in a better place? How can we encourage them to say, Hey, there's so much more without saying I'm forcing you to change. Yeah. Because it has to come from you, right? No one else could do it. 
I like Carol Dweck's way of looking at it. She was a psychologist in Stanford, and she discovered that there was one single factor that made someone successful in any single area of life, whether it's sports, business, relationships. It was depending on their mindset, and she labeled it the two types of mindset. There was a fixed mindset, and there was a growth mindset. A fixed mindset thinks that their mindset, their talents, their abilities, what they can do is happens to them. It's because of them, because of a trauma. And this is how their life is going to have to stay forever. It's because they were born that way. So they're not a good cook and they'll never be able to be a good cook. While a growth mindset realizes that if they put the work and they put the effort in it, then eventually over time, they'll be able to get there. So practically for someone who's in this space right now, the best thing I would tell you to do is go and research um, the differences between growth and fixed mindset. I have a lot of information about it on any of my socials. Um, Google it on Google, literally do what's the difference between growth and fixed mindset. And essentially you'll see the whole concept of just like not being perfect and having an amazing life. Rather, I am learning. I am working hard. I'm moving one baby step closer to my goal of what I wanted to, even though right now it's hard. I know I could do it. And you built up to the, or eventually where you could do it. Mm -hmm. I have a blog on fixed mindset, growth mindset, the different types of mindsets. And I believe it was episode two or three of coaching and session that we're like on 141 right now. So there was the early stages of the podcast. We were talking about growth mindset, fixed mindset is so powerful because then when we get into the idea of, okay, well, we had a trauma, right? So we're in that fixed mindset. If we don't want to change, or maybe we had that trauma, we turn into a growth mindset, but then that other factor of, well, we didn't have a trauma yet, but we do the work to change our mindset to become a growth mindset type of person. So then we say, you know what, there's so much more for me than us saying, okay, I can figure this out. And the way we do that is by reading good content, personal development, growth mindset. There, there's so much that we can do when it comes to getting a growth mindset. And there's maybe not so much tips or tricks how to get a growth mindset, but what is the process? Maybe you went on a journey where you might have been maybe a fixed mindset person, maybe in high school, or maybe you were always a growth mindset, but how did you evolve to the next level? of wanting to start your own business and then helping people reach a growth type of mindset. I want to talk to you about that. Yeah. So it's a bit interesting when now, when I, before I knew the words of growth and fixed mindset, I always had this like really negative attitude. Like when I was a kid, like probably like 10 years old, my mom made me watch every single version of Pollyanna, <laughs> you know, like a type, I was like so negative and I just like had no, and I didn't like it. And I wasn't interested. And I'm telling you watching it didn't make any difference. I don't know what the moment was, but there was something in me that like snapped at some point in like my early teens when I was like, okay, like enough is enough. There's, I am so much more than this and I know I can be better. I have like these big dreams and they're not going to happen with me just like complaining about everything else happening in my life. So what I did at that stage, I was like probably like eighth or ninth grade. I started reading tons of like personal development books anything I could get my hands on. I would listen to audiobooks. Um, I don't know if I was so much into podcasts then, but it came later on. And I really just like all the content I was putting in, I was extremely conscious about what am I doing? So that way I can become a better person. So what happened was back to that mindset, I switched that into a growth mindset. I constantly wanted to learn, constantly wanted to grow. And then as those years went on, that growing went on and the learning went on and I was able to get to where I am today. Mm. I just thought about something very interesting. There's a thing called conscious eating, right? Where we're aware of what we eat. What would be the term of conscious input of the things that we put into our life? So like you were reading personal development books and you're getting into podcasts a little bit later. What would that word be called? I don't think there is a term for that right now. Yeah, I think it's not only what's putting in, but I think it's also like what you're keeping out. Like mm. I think in high school, I decided I'm not being interested in any news, not nothing. Maybe I went like a big stream and you don't want to go so extreme as me. Cause yeah. like literally like cut off, like unless someone tells me about something, I'm not knowing what's going on in the world, but just specific, even just like 
movies and like everything that I was listening to, I was being like super conscious. It's like, is this something that I want my brain to mm. take in? So even on, let's say bad days, like when I'm feeling low, because yeah, we're human. And I'm like, not really interested in listening to these things. Sometimes I just play them. And even though I'm not really listening to it, I know my subconscious is listening to it. So it's taking it in and still making sure I'm heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And though you're not listening to the words per se, there's a vibe or energy or a type of decibel that comes to your body. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the study of positive and negative self-talk to plants. Yes. Where <laughs> you can talk negative to a plant and the plant will actually shrivel up and die, even if you water it, if you're talking negative to it on a consistent basis. And I find that to be so interesting where it's a plant that we can feed, you know, water, but still the fact that we're giving it negative words and negative vibration, then it says, okay, well, I'm just going to start shriveling up versus the plants that are being told positive things. They're going to be more lush, more green, fuller, and they're going to be surviving. That way of, of thinking is such a high level way of thinking because many people just kind of get in their car, turn on any station that's a popular station, or they might, might like to listen to NPR, some type of news, but it's not so much about personal development. Personal development is one of those things that many people don't see as very personal. They just kind of say, well, that's for, you know, people who believe in that stuff and I don't believe in it. You know, my life is this, maybe they're a fixed mindset person, very possible, but getting into that world of, I'm going to be very cautious about what I allow in my life. That's important because it's the same thing with people. I'm not going to allow a person who's going to be a negative person, a toxic person, because then they're going to be draining from me. And I think many people get into relationships or habits that are not beneficial for them, but they stay there too long. Why do you think people stay in those type of habits for a prolonged period of time? I think it's easier, simple answer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that to really want to work on yourselves, right? That's like, you're doing opposite of what your brain is wired to do your brain like right is there for survival is you're there to do the easiest thing to literally conserve energy that's what your brain is there to do and being conscious about what you're putting in is taking more energy by you listening to personal development audiobook or podcast instead of turning on the radio for the news takes more energy for your brain to process so in order for you to be able to have that control over your brain and tell your brain actually i want to work harder on this you have to have a real reason why I always like asking people like whenever they're trying to work on a goal and it's not working to first get super clear on the deep reason. You ever heard of the seven wise exercise? Mm, yes, I don't use them in my practice, but I do know about them. Yeah. So that idea of where you ask why, and then you get your answer. Why do you want to do this? And you ask why again, seven times to get to your real reason, because when that is crystal clear, then you'll have much bigger motivation to really go and be conscious about these things. Everyone has a different type of journey. And what I noticed in my life is that I started in high school to go on my mindset journey, right? Thinking in a better type of mindset. I got rid of a lot of my friends. I started to be conscious of what I was putting into my brain. And it maybe wasn't so much about personal development. I think what really got me into a better type of thinking was listening to like Zen stories, where I was looking for a lesson. I, I was hungry. My brain was hungry to learn something. It was, it was seeking knowledge because I knew there was something else versus what I was just learning in school. And school does, you know, an okay job at giving us an education, but they don't necessarily fulfill us, right? So I was missing that aspect. I wasn't fulfilled from school. Yes, again, I was getting the education I needed, learning history, English, or, you know, arithmetic, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I asked myself, like, is this is it? W what am I going to do when I'm done with high school? So for me, it was like, okay. I had to figure out my why, right? I had to figure out what type of journey did I want to go. And of course, as I was going on that journey, I would go on one path, I'll go on and I say, okay, I could have shifted a little bit and you shift a little bit. So the mindset journey 
is a journey because you're going to be on it and it's not so much of a destination. What do you say to people who try to reach like a destination? Like people say, well, when I get this, I will be happy, right? So they're thinking about that, that goal or that destination and they're placing their happiness or their future self there rather than paying attention to the present moment. Yeah, exactly. Growth mindset, right? Focuses on the process instead of the outcome. When people honestly say, oh, when I'm there, I'm going to be happy. Such a fixed mindset type of thing. It's like, they don't even want to hear anything else. So Mm -hmm. what I would say to such a person is like, why do you want to wait until then to be happy? You could still have that thing. I'm not telling you not to have that thing. Enjoy it. I'm all for this. Enjoy every single aspect of this life. Make a lot of money. Do whatever you want to do. But you don't have to wait until then in order to be happy. You could be happy as soon as you decide to put in the work to go and be happy. And then through that process, you'll have a lot more happy days in your life. Mm -hmm. What I would like is to get uh, an an understanding of your day. For example, when I wake up, first thing I do is I go to the gym. And typically, I can wake up naturally. I don't need an alarm clock unless I have a late night the night before. So if I'm editing a podcast, if I'm having late calls, there, there's many things that happen in my life that sometimes I'm going to bed past 12 o'clock. I like to wake up sometime around seven, um, sometimes earlier, 630. This naturally, I, I don't, I don't need an alarm clock. And the first thing I do is I get up, get my water bottle and I go to the gym and I'm at the gym. And it's like my chance to meditate, my chance to kind of get in my right state of mind for the day. And then when I come home, it's okay. Well, let me get ready for work, right? Head into the office, whatever work that I have on that docket for the day, it's time to work. Around noon, it's like lunchtime for me. So whenever I have an opening, whether it be 30 minutes or an hour, I'll get some food, cook, whatever I have to do, but then it's back in the office until the evening time. So I have a full pack day where I'm meeting people, podcasts, whatever it be. But during that process, I'm not hating my life. I'm not saying, oh man, I can't wait to work to be over. Oh, I, you know, like I'm so hungry and I'm thinking about other things rather than what I'm focused on. The only time that I'm going to be thinking about the future is if I'm going on vacation per se. And I'm like thinking, okay, I have to worry about all this stuff on vacation. Where am I going to sleep? Am I going to have a rental car? Am I going to get an Uber or a taxi? So those things I'm trying to plan out before I go on the trip. But other than that, my life is pretty much structured where I understand the moments of my day, where when I didn't do that, I was always worried about this and that. And then there was so much stress in my life. What I wanted to do is to get kind of like a in look perspective of your life, your schedule. And then if you make any, if you had made any changes in the recent years, maybe due to the pandemic or whatever it be, but to kind of like let the world know, like what goes on in our head too. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start answering this, but if you have like any specific questions at middle, just like interrupt me. No. (laughs) Okay. So I um, was always very well planned ever since I think it was high school. I always planned my day the night before, and I always knew exactly um, what I was doing when um, with timeframes for everything. However, this was something I started then and it's been the best thing. I do something by adding white space. I always add a little bit more time to tasks than I think that way in case they go extra, then I'll have like, I won't be running late. And also in case I have a break, like I finish early, then I'll have a break to breathe and to like reground myself. Okay. So that's just like a, like a background to what I'm coming, my, what I'm getting my day into. I usually wake up about between 5, 5.30, real early morning person. My brain works best then. And I start by working out at home, usually for about half hour, shower, get dressed. And then I do um, sometimes like EFT, like tapping, huh. um, meditation, journaling, um, like that like changes. I you do all three, but like sometimes two, sometimes three of them, depending how long, depending on my mood, like I'm very big believer in working with your brain and not against it. So if like, I can't do this right now, um, there's no point in me forcing myself to journal if that's not going to work. Right. Um, some prayers, things like that, my morning routine. Then once my about eight o'clock, I'm ready to start my most important task. I know my brain works best then. 
So the, whatever it is, if I'm recording podcasts, I'll do, like for my own show where it's solo and I'm recording like six podcasts for the next six weeks, I'll just sit there and record straight um, six podcasts. If I'm writing blog posts, whatever it is, my most important task of the day that's happened then. Um, then throughout the day, I'm continuing to do work. So that's seeing clients, going on podcasts, things like that. Um, again, I plan my day. So I know every minute what I'm meant to be doing. Usually sometime like in the afternoon-ish, let's say like three, four, I see my brain like starting to like go down and I can't focus as much. I try to use that time if I don't have anything like scheduled specifically with someone on to like reconnect with a friend or something. So whether it's going out or just talking on the phone, I'm very much into social and to me, it really energizes me a lot. I'll use that time to really like reboot my brain so that we in the evening again, I could go back and do a little bit more work. Obviously, the things that don't use as much brain power, like respond to emails and things like people, responses that people are waiting for and plan my day for the next day. So that way I know my next day is set up for success again. We just hit on so many things I'm going to talk about. One, decision fatigue and then being productive in our day. I work better in the morning. For example, I like to go to the gym in the morning, but if I don't go to the gym for some odd reason in the morning, I'm probably going to be writing a blog or something because my brain just after sleep, it's just like, all right, I have a lot to say. And I would write three, four, five pages of content in 30 minutes. Whereas like, wow, that's impressive versus some days when I'm forcing myself to write something and I'm like, this is not happening. And I do the same thing. If I'm not in the right state of mind, I don't do it. So if I'm supposed to be writing a blog, let's say my mornings were packed on Monday because I typically start writing my week blog for on Monday and have it done by Wednesday. But I mean, I could sometimes be starting on Sunday, just depending on my schedule. And so I might get to a Monday and my brain is just not in the right mindset. So I say, I can't write this blog because I'm literally looking at the screen. I have the title, but nothing is coming to my mind. So I say, you know what? I'm not going to do this. And I do something different. So I do like a pivot and I work on something else that my brain is kind of going down that path saying, Hey, I would rather do this. And then I'm still productive. I'm not just going to say, I'm going to sit on the sofa and watch TV. It's, it's different because I, I'm not just forcing myself to do something that my brain is like not allowing easily. And I think that is something to do with being productive too, right? Because now I'm saying I'm going to be less productive if I'm doing this task. So I'm going to do this task because I'm going to be more productive on this task. And then touching base back on the decision fatigue, it's going to be an idea that we're allowed to make so many good choices in a day, good choices. So you have as many choices as you want to make, right? You can get Taco Bell, you can go home and cook your own food, right? You have that choice, right? And in the morning, we typically have more energy. So that means we're going to be more prone to do more high energy tasks, which are typically the better things. Cooking is more energy than going to a fast food restaurant, right? It, that's just what it is. Now, you might get more from cooking because intrinsically, you're like, I love cooking and I feel better, but the energy level associated with it, your brain might not allow that. So that's why in the evening, many people come home from work at five o'clock, they're stopping at a fast food place getting dinner because they're too exhausted. So having that, you know, that forward thinking, let me meal prep, let me get something in the morning, make something in the morning for the evening time. Or they do, I, I know some people who do, who like, like a pressure cooking or, or like a, like a slow cooker, they'll put their food in the morning when they come home, the food is done versus, all right, well, let me figure out my life later in the day. So that's when your brain is thinking, well, I have not that much energy. I just used a bunch. I'm trying to conserve, you know, just in case fight or flight, because that's what the brain does is like, I have to protect myself just in case it's not going to burn itself out. But then we get home and what do we do? We typically go on the sofa. We just watch our TV, Netflix, maybe on our phone. What would be a better alternative for us to a better choice when we're more tired or more fatigued? Okay. So before I answer that question, I just want to like jump onto what you said about the fact that forward thinking is actually a cognitive function. I mentioned like right back in the beginning that 
there are thinking skills that make up thinking. Okay. So thinking is not one big thing. Thinking is made up of 28 parts, 28 thinking skills. They're called cognitive functions. Now we all use them. Some of, some of us have stronger ones. Some of us have weaker ones, but one of those things are being able to make a plan and being able to forward thinking, thinking ahead and being able to actually come to this point. So Many of you that are struggling with this is because this cognitive function is weak. So I could go and tell you, yeah, you know what? I think it's an amazing thing. You should start planning your day every single day. Your dinner every single Sunday should be your dinner plan day and meal prep prep for the whole week. And that might not work for you, for your lifestyle or for your brain, especially if your brain is now, it's almost like it's like missing a screw almost. It doesn't have the ability to think ahead. So instead of just giving you like an answer to that question, I want you to start being conscious in your life. Where could you think ahead? Not when you're tired, not for a really big project, thinking ahead for like in the next hour, right? Like in the morning, when you're fully awake, when your brain still has the energy before you have that fatigue, what can I do right now today? So that way later on, I'll be happy that I did this thing right now. You want to first start by making sure your brain really understands that clearly, then these other problems will actually happen to you. Mm. When it comes to like preparing for the day, some people prefer in the morning, some people prefer in the night. One of the first steps you have to do, do you prefer to plan for your day tomorrow, the day before? or as soon as the day begins, right? Yes, you can plan in the afternoon if you want to, but like, let's just keep it simple for today. Do you wanna be a morning planner or a night planner? And you plan for the day ahead and you're gonna have a preference, right? And if you think you don't, try one day in the morning, try one time at night and see which one you enjoy more. You're just naturally going to enjoy something more. Typically, if you're the type of person to be more lazy in the evening, you're actually going to prefer just to go on your phone, go to your notes and just type what you want to do tomorrow versus in the morning when you're full of energy, you're ready to go, right? So, so depending on just who you are, your energy level, there's so many factors that play a role into that. And one of the steps, I guess, would be if we want to raise our cognitive level of thinking would be getting that forward planning, start to think about, okay, I'm going to do this. So we get our schedule on point, our routines on point, what would be some other ways that we can improve our cognitive thinking where we can make it stronger? So when we get into those moments of low energy, we can still be thinking at a higher level. Yes. So another one of the cognitive um, function is being able to like, it's called clear perception, being able to see things clearly. Now, a very extreme example of this is people who don't have this, who have it very weak is like they open up a book and they just open from a middle and they start reading without like, they know really the beginning of the book is the first page, but they just open from a middle because that's the way they think they have to sign a paper and they're just looking, they're not like reading anything. They're just looking right. Um, but we all have this in different times. It comes up in different places. Once again, different levels of weakness and strongness, but what you can do is for yourself is what I like to call you make a starting point. What is the starting point for right here, right now? So let's say even you want to plan your day. You're like, I don't know. I have like a hundred things tomorrow. Mm -hmm. How am I ever going to do everything? Just ask yourself, what is my starting point? What is the first thing when I get up, when I get out of bed, what am I doing? Making my bed, brushing my teeth. What am I doing literally? And then take it on from there. Because once you have your starting point, your brain starts rolling and could think of like, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? Instead of just like a whole big blurry picture. Mm. Do you think this is something that children can start to do? Because it seems like yes. when we're younger, our parents kind of rule our life. You're going to go to school. You have to do this. You have to do that. But are there going to be areas where a child can learn to increase their cognitive levels? Because if they do that at a young age, it's going to be easier when they're teens and then when they're young adults. Yes. So actually improving cognitive functions could start from when you're three years old. Um, obviously some things later on, but you could start from there. As a parent who is aware of these cognitive functions, you could empower your children to be able to like use these cognitive functions in their everyday life. So going back to a starting point, it could be anything. Let's say you're setting the dinner table together with your child. You could ask your child, what's the first thing? What is our starting point to set this table? Do we need to put on 
tablecloth? Are we putting on placemats? Are we just putting on plates? Like have the child come up with the answer. A really good way to do this, both either for yourself or for a child, is to ask questions so the brain starts thinking of an answer and pulling it at yourself. So every time you're not sure of something, what to do, just ask yourself, what do I see here? Get your brain clear. What do I have to do? And then what is my solution to here? Ask the questions to help your brain um, think of an answer. Mm, I think that's helpful for parents too, because many parents just kind of say to do this, do that, but then they don't necessarily tell them the reason why. So the kid just says, well, this is how I have been taught this, or this is how it's always been done. And then they get into that thinking of, well, this is just who I am, right? So it's kind of like a cascading effect where parents teach children like subconsciously how to think later in life, where they just say, well, this is who I am versus they don't understand that their parent actually was teaching them these behaviors, this way of thinking from an early age. Parenting is one of those things where it can make or break a child, where parents play such a critical role in the child's development. And when a parent is not productive, a child sees that too, right? So if they see mom or dad on the sofa after work, the kid is going to associate, well, after I go to work, I come home and I go on the sofa. So understanding that aspect and going into the next topic is yes, productivity can be viewed from a child's standpoint and they look at the parent. And I know I have a good audience of parent listeners, so they're probably going to want to know, how can I kick myself in the butt and get up and stop being so lazy? Yeah. Oh, it's so hard. Now, first of all, don't be so hard on yourself because like I said, a lot of it is from the way your brain is wired. If it's easier for you, going back to that motivation that we spoke about in the beginning, if you could make your motivation, your why of why you're doing this for your children, then it might for you, depending on you as a person, it might be a little bit easier for you. So instead of just saying, oh, I have to be productive. You want to say, I want to be productive for me, for my children to have a good role model. And we could actually be productive together. Now I know doing things with children takes a whole lot longer, right? Um, But as much as you could to have your children involved in things in a fun way. It makes cooking dinner fun. It makes cleaning the house fun, folding laundry, all those things that you need to do anyways and be productive. And the kids can learn how they too, besides for learning the life skills, but just also the skills of how to set up their day, how to be productive, what comes next, what makes sense to do first, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the idea of being productive, especially in a society where we have learned to be not as productive, where our smartphones can do so much for us, where we can not have to go to the library. We can just go on our smartphone, get the data we need. When I was younger, I would have to go and put into work and say, okay, I have to go ask the librarian, where is this section? And then I would have to go on the computer if, if, if they didn't have a catalog where I would say, okay, I'm going to try to figure out what type of books I want. And then I go into the area And then I'm literally looking through the shelves of those bookshelves just trying to find the book. And I'm like, I can't find this book. There's so many books here. And then I call the librarian. The librarian finds it in two seconds. I'm like, how did that happen? Uh, And so not many people are going to be getting that experience anymore. Libraries are going to be one of those things that are almost a relic in our day and age where our smartphone reigns supreme and it makes our life easier, but then it kind of dumps us down a little bit. And there was a study of how our smartphones, that they're lowering our cognitive levels of critical thinking, because we don't have to think critically anymore. We can just type in an answer if we need to know something rather than opening up a book and then literally going to the index. Okay, it's on page 97. Let me go to page 97. That is gone versus, all right, got my smartphone, go to Google, type what I want. The answer is given to me. What are going to be the pros and cons of going down that path of allowing society to be productive for us rather than us taking that type of productivity and looking for the answers in our life? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't really know I have the answer, but I do know that just saying like, oh, technology is the fault here is not like not solving anything. Every single person can take responsibility for their selves and work on 
improving their cognitive skills. I'm all for it. Make your life easier. If Google is easier for you to search on things, doesn't mean you have to go to the library every time you want an answer to get something. But you don't either want to become stupid because of it. So the time that you save going to the library, instead of use that time on using brain games, right? Instead of just watching Netflix, maybe you could make family night once a week. You play games, you buy any of the games that actually make you use your brain. So yes, like games like Monopoly are fun, but there's a lot more games where you have to like actually think, right? So like a classic is like chess, but there's like tons of them. If you just look on the shelves in any of the game store, you'll see, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you use that time instead to go, yes, you still have that family time and you can make it fun with popcorn and snacks, but you're now being conscious about, I am using my brain in a fun way to think critically. And instead of my brain dying, it's actually growing. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much more than just looking at technology or looking at a library as the problem or the solution. Yeah. You have to sometimes put somebody in your corner like yourself where it's like, hey, if you're needing to be more productive, if you're needing a boost, why not get someone who can help you, a coach, a guide to elevate that? Because yes, you could be a parent right now and you're trying to figure out how can you be more productive. And sometimes having someone who can hold you accountable is exactly what you need. So what I wanted to get from you is a few last words, and then please tell people where they can find you. So your brain is always growing. What? I want you to remember from this is that you are in control of your brain, not your brain is in control of you. And you have to be conscious about what you're doing to grow your cognitive skills, to be thinking, to growing those dendrites and actually become smarter. We have like something like 86 billion neurons in our brain with dendrites on them, like those little lines coming out. And when we do challenges and we learn new things, they grow new networks and literally like it's growing till the day we die. If we're using them, if not, then they're dying. So you want to be the one in charge of your brain. You want to have that growth mindset and see what you could do in a way that works with your brain and your lifestyle. So that way your cognitive skills are constantly growing because it's going to affect every area of your life. So I'm everywhere. Life Picks University. So that's L-I-F-E, Life Picks, P-I-X. Okay, university, um, podcast, and website. You'll find that all socials, the same thing. So, if anyone's looking for a productivity coach, head over to Life Picks and check out the website, the blogs, all her content is going to be valuable in the sense of helping you become more mindful, more productive, and a better member of society, per se. Because now that you're more active, you're going to be able to help more people. So, encourage everyone again check out all her information is going to be in the description box below so if you're driving don't crash it's going to be there waiting for you when you get home everyone st rap report thank you so much for coming thank you so much michael this was fun